Welcome to the Dividend Talk Podcast, episode 35. Earnings season continued. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Dividend Talk. I'm your co-host, Engineer My Freedom, and today I'm joined with European DJI. This is a podcast where we discuss our passion for dividend growth investing with our own unique European flavor. If you're new to this channel, please hit the like button and subscribe to us, and check out our previous episodes on YouTube and Spotify. See you on the inside. Welcome everyone. I'm here joined with European DJ as always. How are you doing, buddy? Really well. Um, really great weather here. I don't know how it's on your side there on the island, but it's like minus 10 here, minus 11, lots of snow. So a proper Polish winter finally again. So I'm really, really happy. How about yourself? Uh, we, we were promised snow here all week and all we've got is rain. So it's the same, same, same as usual. But we've, we have a good show today. We have a special guest with us the king of the one pagers on twitter it's dividend wave how are you doing hey guys it's a it's a pleasure to be on your show uh i'm doing pretty well as well i'm in the heart of europe and we had plenty of snow here so doing good i mean it, it, it's great to have you on the show i'm after getting loads of messages on twitter after we announced that you were coming on today just to say thank you for all your one pagers particularly during earning season where i think we can all agree I don't know where you get the time, but you just keep posting updates and just keeping us all up to date. So we're really, we're both really excited to have you here. Um, we're going to talk earnings with you. And yeah, I'm really excited. But before we kick any of that off, do you want to just give a brief intro of who you are and what you do just for, for our listeners? Sure. Look, I'm, um, I'm European, like you guys. I live in the center of Europe. Um, I, I've started dividing and in investing um, probably uh eight eight nine years ago uh, i got some equity through my company uh, which happens to pay a dividend and then i just started to think why why don't i invest more and get more dividends i i probably one day i will be able to live off of this so that, that's what i've done and essentially i invest around let's say 75 to 80 percent of um of my portfolio is uh dividend growth uh investing the growth is important for me and uh, that that's one of the things it's not just dividend it has to be dividend and growing uh, and that's the, the the famous equation right make make sure that it keeps growing year after year i i have a little portion of um 10 to 15 percent that is uh pure growth and it started with uh, ebay i bought ebay in 2014 and as of then I've always had a little bit of uh, other growth stocks, and we were just talking just before the show. I, I I trade a little bit. That's that's my casino gambling part, but it's it's very it's a very small portion of it. It's just for almost fun and just to track a few companies that you keep it on on your trading app and you know the price and you. Uh, but it, it's not serious. It, it's just to uh, to scratch that itch and that's it. And I have a bit of Bitcoin. So I, um, I I bought Bitcoin uh, last summer, actually. I wanted to have one Bitcoin. If there's only going to be 21 million Bitcoins, why don't I have one? That never came to be. I'm still a fraction of a Bitcoin. But it's, a, uh, I, it's, it's another world out there. So I, I wanted a little bit of exposure. Maybe I'll buy some other crypto, but uh, I'm not big into that. Uh, I, I think we started talking about that. And, there's a lot of question marks behind, but I, I believe in the technology as well. I think blockchain and all these transactions probably one day will be uh, will be uh, made easy, and I earn interest on it. I, I have my um, my Bitcoin on Celsius uh, Celsius Network, and they pay uh, dividend every Monday. So it's a, it's a nice way to start the week. You get your dividend payment uh, on uh, or interest, but I call it my div my crypto dividend. Uh, it, on the Monday, 
it's funny when I hear you say you want to have one Bitcoin because I had that urge for a long time and I finally got there. And what did I do? I, I sold it and put it into some shit kind that, that also <laughs> paid dividend and I'm bitter about it ever since. <laughs> but, I, I, Tommy. Uh, and I was just going to say that uh, that uh, that's it uh, in terms of my my philosophy. And coming back to the um, to the to the one pagers, I, I start do I started doing it um, because I, I was talking to a couple of friends of mine that um, that also do dividend investing, um, and it was just the thesis. What are the things that would make you do it right? And essentially, it's a if you look at the one pagers, it's just a SWOT. With a little bit of uh, what are the, the 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 well the SWOT of the company, most of it comes from the 10K. A little bit of the financials from income statement, cash flow, and uh, and balance sheet, and a little bit of the few uh, metrics uh, like PEs and uh, uh, free cash flow uh, payout ratios and so on. Just just as a thesis, and that I was sharing with friends and then with the community to see challenge me on this what's what am i seeing in this company why do i like this company or should why shouldn't i like this company so it's a it's a nice interesting thesis and uh, and then i found you guys which was very interesting because you, you were very similar to me in terms of your uh the way you interacted on twitter the the, the things you posted you had your blogs that i i've started to check so it was super interesting and uh, just coming back to the name uh dividend wave it's it's basically crossover of of the, the the kind of the two interests, which is surfing in real life, when I can, when I have the opportunity, and and dividend investing, and um, hopefully it will become uh, bigger as well in a website one day. Uh, I've got I've got a a friend of mine who also invests, and eventually we will build something, and probably a YouTube channel one day. Who knows? So thank you for having me, guys. It's it's a great honor. I love your show. Awesome. Hey, we look forward to your YouTube channel and also that website. You you need to trademark onepage.com or something or, or just, <laughs> just grab that. <laughs> Thank so, you. And uh, and uh, I was just going to say, and I love that uh, uh, EDGI started to do uh, a few one pagers, and it's 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 really great when you see the uh, because some things you don't think about, and he included stuff that I said, damn it, I've I've always wanted to include the. The share count, I never found a, a way to do it and so on, and stuff that is important, right? And I, I love that you also have the metrics of um, how you see the, the discount cash flow models and so on. How do you see it? And, and uh, it's it's stuff that really helps you think more about how do you invest in the companies that you like to invest. So it's, it's fabulous that I found you guys. Super. But um, what I would suggest is that we do some rapid fire questions yet yeah, to really get through the true uh, person that you are. So the first one that I have for you, and, and you can you must choose one, and afterwards you may only explain one of those one of your answers if you want to explain a bit more about it. So the first one, Barcelona or Madrid? Uh, Barcelona. Okay. Tesla or Neo? Tesla. Put options or call options? None. You must choose, sorry. Um, put. OK. Cold showers or writing a journal? <laughs> Cold showers. <laughs> IBM or GameStop? IBM all day. Thank you. Is there anything you would like to clarify? <laughs> They're all self-explanatory. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, now, I, I know I you. now I really know who you are. Thank you. I didn't know this was coming. This was not in the terms and conditions that I signed. <laughs> I love how EDGI was so strict with the rules. <laughs> you have to answer. <laughs> exactly. That's great. I, I, we have this. Uh, we have uh, uh, this joke about IBM that uh, you love to hate IBM. And I hate IBM, but I, I I still love it in a in a weird sense. Yeah. Well, having said that, let's go to the news of the week. And um, uh, let let me start maybe then about some news because what I noticed uh, in the news, what passed by, I actually like the website. Uh, I fucking love science. 
because there's really interesting stuff on there. You you would be surprised what kind of research people do. But um, uh, this time I uh, I it caught my attention that in uh, that Bitcoin right there's still the op possibility to mine some bitcoins, and at the moment the energy consumption of of mining bitcoins but bitcoins is supposed to be uh, already more consumption than whole Argentina as a whole. And if it would be a country in Bitcoin consumption, it would be the 30th country by size in the world. So this is for me really, really in in interesting and, and actually close to Norway as well. So like all the water power they have, all the wind power in Norway, if you would just put this all together, it is the consumption currently required for mining Bitcoins. And I find it amazing um, when, when I think about that because it seems to that there's still a bit, uh, sorry, a, a business case for mining Bitcoin at the moment at current prices. And, and I guess it will go up, right? Because as as Bitcoin goes up and it's at whatever I, I was trying to check it just now, it's whatever forty nine thousand dollars each bit, Bitcoin. So probably there there's a there's a use case there. Not not yeah, a yeah I wouldn't. I wouldn't be surprised if we start building nuclear plants somewhere to um, to support Bitcoin mining, right? So that becomes really a business case. But I think, um, David Wave, you also had a news item there around Tesla, uh, I believe. I think the news of the week is is actually uh, Tesla putting Bitcoin in the balance sheet, right? They had the authorization from the board to uh, to to go into digital assets, and they've they've made the plunge. So we we got with the uh, with the 10K this week, we got the announcement that. Uh, Tesla put 1.5 billion in bitcoins. We don't we don't know how many exactly, and what was the price, but we know they bought it in January. So it, it will be interesting to see when we finally get to know the number. Um, but ultimately, th this is very interesting, right? This opens a whole new game in the uh, in the S S and P 500 and uh, and the companies that will follow. So. Uh, if I would have to wager a guess, in a year's time, we will see probably five to ten percent of the companies that will put um, bitcoins into their balance sheet. That's that's my guess at the moment. I think there's uh, Tesla. Tesla really changes a lot of minds and a lot of uh, uh, and a lot of the rules of the game, right? They've they've built a lot of the the new rules, and uh, I've I, I've wagered as well that. With so many people sitting in, uh, so the same people sitting in different boards of companies, there will be an incentive to not be left behind. So edge the downside by doing what others are doing. So I I honestly believe that we will see quite a few more companies following. So for me, this means that the narrative of Bitcoin just changed with this uh, one action, right? So. Uh, if, if this is the case, then I can only see the price of Bitcoin growing from that point of view. If there will be more demand than uh, selling pressure. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I mean, I'm glad Tesla bought a dip in January. I mean, <laughs> they, they must have been they must have been following us on Twitter or something. But I, I, I've been I've been following Bitcoin closely for a number of years, and there's always talk of it hitting 100k and, and beyond. And it's certainly looking like it will will hit those kind of figures, and and probably soon. Um, I mean, Elon just has to to put Bitcoin in his Twitter profile, and it and it'll jump off ten percent. So, whenever he needs an extra few bob, he'll just I don't know, he'll just tweet Bitcoin, and it'll shoot up in price. But it's 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 a game changer. Certainly, it's it's a game changer. And I mean, how do you how do you tax this? Uh, I mean, it's 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 crazy when you think about it. This is unimaginable five years ago. And the, and another another company that will probably benefit from this and connecting to your previous topic, uh, EDGI, it's probably going to be uh, Nvidia and uh, and uh, uh, TSMC, the the Taiwan semiconductor company, because the, these guys are doing the GPUs and the chips that are needed to 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 feed all these uh, mining of Bitcoin are coming from these two companies. They, these are kind of the most advanced electricity that powers these. So I think these companies will see big jumps as well as mm. as more power is needed to to mine it. And when more power is needed, then companies like Rio Tinto and uh, BAP Billiton with all the brown coal mines are really interesting as well. 
Yeah, <laughs> it's the ecosystem. It's the the circle of life of uh, of stocks coming exactly. uh, coming on. Huh? Um, any other news to, uh, uh, still that we saw this week? Yeah, m more on on Tesla, but more of a, a negative view on them this week. And I, I find it quite interesting that they've had to rec recoil over twelve thousand of their Model X cars over some faulty molding kit, and it has zero impact on like under share price if, if if this was to happen any other car manufacturer you'd probably see a five ten percent drop in their share price but this this has been barely even reported um so i i just found it quite interesting i've been i've been reading up a little bit on on them and the short squeeze that was happening seems to be filtering out and there is one guy that i follow on on twitter and stuff and he's expecting now that the price to come down a little bit so i, I i'm always interested to see how like as we said tesla are rule breakers they're, they're paving the way in so many things so just keeping an eye on them and just watching watching what they're doing really okay so we'll, we'll move on we'll move on to our main topic which we'll talk about some of the earnings um david and wave if you if you want to go first i know you were looking at i think pepsi was one of the first companies you had yeah um gladly i'll, I'll jump into it so i think pepsi had a very very solid quarter um, and then for the full year, also very interesting results. So uh, I'll just go quickly, quickly through some metrics. They um, for the full year, and I'll talk about full year. Uh, their their revenue went up almost five percent. Uh, their cash from operations uh, was up ten percent, so that was pretty good. And free cash flow was uh, almost eighteen percent. So very very solid numbers. Uh, the net income. Uh, it was slightly down, and that was, I think, the uh, one of the two worrying things in the in the results, as the um, the the cost of goods sold and uh, and GNA uh, went proportionally higher versus the revenue, so so they didn't generate as much net income. Uh, but the good news as well is that their um, their payout ratio was at uh, eighty six percent of free cash flow so that that was pretty good and in terms of uh segment revenue they they did went up um in all in all reportable segments except for latam which was down uh four percent um but on the growth the the, the shining stars were africa uh with uh, 25 percent uh, and here this was due to an acquisition uh, that they uh, that they've done of pioneer foods in south africa um, and during the year, they also bought um, Rockstar Energy uh, beverages for almost four billion, and they bought as well a company in China for 0 0.7. So, really, a uh, really interesting year for for Pepsi. So, pretty decent. What did you guys think about it? Yeah, I like. Uh, I mean, I, I own Pepsi. It's one of my top ten uh, foundational stocks. Um, I the only thing I always have is a little bit the concern uh, about the high payout ratios and 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 the buybacks and the debt increasing. So that's always what I'm paying an, uh, attention to. And I think from that point of view, they they just had a good year this year. So uh, for me, it's positive because I would like to see them even just growing the dividend a little bit slower and start cleaning up the balance sheet again for before you know the interest rate starts rising and everything because i'm a, that's where i have my fear a little bit with pepsi that if we see high inflation inter interest rates rising that it starts impacting their growth and i think they don't need this because it's really a a powerhouse of a company i prefer it much more than coca-cola as an example yeah so i think numbers. i th yeah, I think that I, I agree with you, especially those the, the the forty billion in long term debt because of these acquisitions. That that's a concern point. But when we see versus Coca Cola, I think this di diversification to snacks really paid off this year in this in the in the stay at home and indulge on snacks. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And you, EMF, what did you think about it? Yeah, with, with Pepsi, I, I'm the same. It, it's the it's the depth and the payout ratio that that kind of scares me a little bit. Um, I have a, sm a small position in them, but I find them a little bit overvalued. So I'm, I'm kind of just staying away. I, I know Dapper Dividends is buying like one a week of of them, but I I, I briefly looked at them and they 
they didn't stand out. I just think there's better opportunities. So I'm, I'm kind of sidestepping. Maybe when they dip in price, when, when we get some sort of dip, I might I might look at them. But at the moment, the debt is too high and, and the cash flow, the pay ratio is a little bit too high for me. So they're not for me at the minute. Good. So then EMF, I think you looked into uh, one of your favorite companies as an engineer. I remember you always uh, speaking with so much pride about their equipment. So I'm really curious to to hear what you thought about their numbers. And I also know you you wrote something about it this week, I believe. Yeah, I I, I do I do like Cisco. And I I like them as a company and as a brand. And as I said, I use their equipment almost daily. But I was I was really disappointed with with these results. I, I just maybe I expected too much because on the the more I look at it, I was being a little bit harsh on them, but I mean, it's the fifth straight quarter of revenue decline. So this is before COVID. This this started before COVID. So we can't purely blame COVID for, for the decline in revenue that, that's happened five quarters in a row. Th they did beat earnings, um, but they dipped, I think, 5% overnight in share price. And, and that's because they gave no real guidance into their future. I don't see anything. No, nothing sticks out to me on what's going to drive their, their future growth. People are talking about WebEx. I've used WebEx once and it was horrendous. And I've, I've never used it again. Um, actually, the company that, that suggested I said, we had a talk on, on Microsoft Teams that we're not going to talk because it was it was, it was was horrible. But they have been making acquisitions to, to improve that. And I, I understand. But I, I just can't see them challenging Zoom teams or, or even google meet or anything like that it's webex is that on arrival with a new version i mean people that uh, want to invest in cisco for webex they could well as well go to uh, uh, to give it for charity the money because webex is not going to make it to your point it was good in 2010 but we live in 2021 now yeah like I'm, I'm not i'm not overly convinced with it they, they, they gave some indication in the last quarter that governments and corporations were starting to spend money and come back and i was expecting to see the infrastructure platforms you no know, benefit from that but they actually declined quarter on quarter again which suggests that they were not spending or they were not opening up as much as, as cisco led us to believe there was no growth in the applications which uh, in this environment at the moment that's where i would have expected to see some sort of growth the, the fact that that stayed flat over the last year that's disappointing for me, especially when we've seen other companies knock this out of the park. I know Cisco are trying to transform into a kind of a software subscription based based company. I mean, I'm I'm not totally convinced at, at the moment. It was, I said, look, it, it it is what it is. It was it was disappointing. The only bit of good news is that they increased the dividend a lot lower than than previous. It was three percent, so it was a one cent increase per per quarter. But I mean, I, I, there was nothing in there that I got excited about. So I was I was hoping for so, some bit of good news, and I probably would have bought them at, at a reasonable price. But at the moment, I just can't see where their future growth has come from, apart from acquisitions. I mean, they have the cash; they can they can just keep buying companies, and and that's what they've been doing. But I mean, how long can they do that for? So the only thing I can tell about Cisco, they have one of the best ceos that is recognized as being one of the best ceos in the world and uh, how cisco transformed also over the last de decade before they got into this situation where they are now is just amazing uh, the cisco culture is often uh, really uh, appraised for for how good it is and such so i believe if they have this then then this might be just a winter for them to transform um, but for instance if i would compare it to intel I've got way more confidence in Cisco because of its management, because of the company culture uh, that I read a lot about. And I think they have they have also the technology for the 20 uh, uh, for for this uh, I would say decade that we are in now. So I think it's really about getting the right transformation and not do like IBM be in denial for too long because <laughs> then it becomes the next IBM. It, it it's funny you mentioned Intel and and there's some early comparisons that you can see with intel when when intel started to try and turn or when they're on the way down and i've read i can't remember if it was on twitter but but someone mentioned to me that they lost one of their key staff to zoom they, they, he tried to progress webex in, in a situation and the 
was you no know, the board wasn't listening to him or taking it serious, so he went off and, and helped set up Zoom. That's something similar we saw with Intel. And if, if Cisco start to lose key people like that, then they could be they could be in for a, a long winter. I, I, I know David M. Wave, you're interested in Cisco as well. What was your take on it? Yeah, you 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 just described the the, the CEO of Zoom, Eric Yuan. He was mm. uh he was uh, in uh, in Cisco and he was not being heard, so that's why he left. He, he yeah. came in with the acquisition of Webex actually, and and then he left and just built something that could have been at Cisco, right? Uh, my I have a small I have a small position in uh, in Cisco as well, and I think your blog post summarized it perfectly and what you've just said now. For me, it was a bit disappointing, uh, especially the applications. If they're not growing applications now when is it going to happen uh, and this is the part that for me is is the most troubling infrastructure I, I i can give them a pass on it physically there's less things happening right there's uh, on the infrastructure side uh i don't see it yet this jump to software uh and subscriptions that they they really want to do it so i i'm getting concerned about it uh and, and i see that uh at least that's how I'm reading it. A lot of the acquisitions, they, they've done a monstrous number of acquisitions uh, throughout the years. And it seems like a lot of them are just pure blocking. It's just to avoid that others get slightly bigger and can eat away their their a portion of their market. So yeah. I, they've not been true um, growth engines. It, it seems like Microsoft, like whatever, 10 years ago, when they were buying small things to, to stop them from growing. Yeah, it, it and that's a good take on on their acquisitions because I was I was I was getting lost trying to follow every acquisition they've made and 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 most of the time it's say in the security business, uh, Palo Alto bought a company so in response Cisco buy a company to to try and grab back some market share so it's 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 almost like they're jousting and they're just buying companies that other companies can't buy to help them stay in the game. Um, I mean, the only positive is the security segment grew ten percent, but that's that's a small small part, and they're not even a market leader in in that segment. So, I I mean, I I don't know, I don't know what what to think. I I'll keep an eye on over the next couple of quarters. It, it's it's like what EDI said when he was spotting a company in decline, and and are we seeing that now? Is is that an early sign? And I think it's that actual podcast, that episode that has maybe put this in my forefront now and trying to catch these these early signals and at the moment i i bought walgreens i've bought shell i have a small position in cisco i have bought a lot of companies that that are in this situation and i have enough of that at the moment and i just want to focus on actual quality companies like our johnson johnson and microsoft that are showing actual real growth and, and that can grow agreed super so it will be nice to see uh, Cisco in 2021 and how it will be uh, performing, and uh, also when the um, how is it if the world reopens again, it will be really interesting, and I'm sure we will be talking more often because of that also on this uh, podcast. So I think then the next company that we want to talk about is a bit uh, about Coca-Cola. Okay, um, do you want to take this one, David and Wave? Sure, I'll, uh, I'll 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 start from where I think it, it's it's uh, a big disappointment, honestly. Uh, for the full year, um, the results were down in revenue, eleven percent, uh, cash from operations, six uh, percent down, and free cash flow is three uh, percent up, just because capex was cut significantly. So overall, the the payout ratio for 2020 did not move versus 2019 it sits at 81 percent but the, the long-term uh, long-term debt also uh grew by 45 percent so all of it we we don't have yet the 10k out so it was just the, the press release uh with these figures but it does by comparison again now to pepsi because we've been we we've gone through pepsi that had a really good year in a in a stay-at-home environment and it's interesting to see that that uh, that Coke uh, had just the opposite. So two two different worlds, and uh, probably here the snacks are making a big difference. What I, what do you guys I, think? 
I think Coca-Cola rely more heavily on shops and pubs and bars and, and all this being open. And, yeah. and the fact that they've been closed for so long has has definitely impacted them a lot more than, than Pepsi. You, you spoke of Pepsi and their snacks. I don't see a comparison there with, with Coca-Cola that you will go out go out and buy. So I can, I can understand why it's it's worse th than Pepsi this year. Um, but, I mean, Ireland has just announced we're, we're still in a lockdown until May. I'm I'm going to guess that European countries are going to follow. I don't know about the states, but it doesn't look like it's going to get better anytime soon for these guys. Yeah, and I also think that Coca-Cola has a branding issue, not as the brand itself, but it is seen as a sugar thing, right? And with the health conscious consumer, I I, I have a feeling that uh, they don't get away with Diet Coke or Coca-Cola Zero enough. Um, so I think that's also not helping them. I'm just wondering about Coca-Cola. I mean, they're the last decade, effectively. Um, I'm just wondering what to do with it. For me, it's rather a bond. When you look at the share price, I don't see any reason to invest in Coca-Cola at this moment. There's no growth. I don't see a catalyst. I think they spend a lot of energy to 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 maintain what they have. And... and that's it. But for historically, this is one of those Johnson & Johnson's, right, for, as a dividend company. But the last decade has been nothing. And since I started dividend investing, I've been always looking at Coca-Cola. And never, never I found a moment that I thought, okay, now I want to have it. Now there's a catalyst. I just don't know. Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting that you say that that in the, uh, in the presentation uh, for the full year results, they have on slide number eight, for somebody that bothers to see it, they have uh, as innovation pipeline, Coca-Cola zero sugar 2.0, whatever that is. So it seems that the, the management team there agrees with you that this needs uh, this needs another uh, iteration and another jump. But what the health, con the health conscious consumer, which I consider myself to, right, switched almost purely to water. Yeah, because all the juices, all the chemicals, what they do is they buy buy uh, uh, origins in the shop. They squeeze their own orange juice. They make their own stuff. It's water, and and thinking about Coca Cola getting into your body is just it just doesn't it doesn't match. Yeah. So and this is where, for instance, th uh, things like Burger King do it much better with with meat alternatives and such. Uh, yeah. Th then you can still get into it. But Coca Cola. If, it's still toxic yeah, for a health conscious consumer, whether it's zero sugar or not. It's not the sugar. It's also the rest of the stuff, right? <laughs> the, only, the only good thing around it is the bottle. Yeah. Iconic. Anyway, uh, maybe this is also a good topic to go to Heineken because it's the third beverage and it seems to be beverage week uh, for this. And, you know, these numbers were horrible from Heineken. And I think it's exactly the same as Coca-Cola, to your point, uh, EMF. Restaurants are closed. Uh, people are not going out, uh, not so much outside in the summer, meeting together, drinking a Heineken. I think this was the same reason with Coca Cola. Uh, probably the people that usually uh, don't want to drink Heineken go for Coca Cola or the way around. But it's the same growth decline, organic uh, minus 12 percent, volume minus 8 person, percent. But if you then look at operating profit, minus 36 uh, person. So you see also the um, the incremental uptake or downtake in what it means in organic volume, how much an impact that has to the bottom line. And we are talking here about Heineken numbers because if you look at the IFRS numbers, the, the accounting standard, they made uh, they made a slight loss uh, in 2020. So they made a what is it a 36 cents uh, loss. Well, if you use their own numbers, they, they claim still a two euro um, diluted EPS. Now, Heineken might not be for many people seen as a dividend company, but they have actually a, quite a rich history of dividends. It's just cutting it from time to time uh, as part of the crisis playbook, but not cutting it to zero. So if you buy such a company uh, at, at the deepest in the market, let's say, uh, during a crash, then you actually can get quite wealthy if you think about all the dividends that are growing because it often also really recovers quickly in their dividend. 
Um, so this year, now in 2020, they didn't. Uh, they decided not to pay an interim dividend, so they only have a final dividend of 70 cents, which may, means also again uh, a dividend cut um, that they have introduced. And um, uh, that dividend cut is around what is it? Uh, almost 60 percent. So I think people that stepped into Heineken for dividends uh, will not be too happy with the results. But that's, uh, again, a sign of a European company, right? They have a dividend policy of paying out 30 to 40% of their earnings. So hence, um, in bad years like this, they have just less earnings. And I think it's exactly the same narrative here as uh, Coca-Cola dividend wave. It's, Heineken, you could almost just change the name of the company and you have the same. True, but I, I like better the portfolio of uh, of Heineken at the moment, honestly. It's got still some iconic brands, right? Uh, if I if I look at what they have and uh, like uh, Birra Moretti in Italy or Givietz in mm. uh, in Poland, Sagres in Portugal, Cruz Campo in Spain, so pretty decent brands. I think it's maybe just a slump year. Let's see. Uh, let's see this year. Restaurants no. are closed. Yeah, most people drink Heineken in the bars, and you cannot go That's to true. a bar right now. That's true. Yeah, I, I I did not know Heineken were a dividend company. First of all, I probably definitely would have bought them because that is probably the drink I would would go to when 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 I'm out. Um, but I know they've cut they've cut the dividend, but they've still got a yield of over two percent, which is which is not too bad. Yeah. I I don't know what the share price is, um, at the moment, but it it might be a good opportunity to buy them, like you said. I mean, when when times are bad. You would expect companies like this when people are not spending money, when people are not going out to to come down a little bit. But when people get back to to normal life, you would expect this kind of company to prosper again, and even more so after a lockdown. Because well, I know in Ireland the first thing we'll do is flock to the pubs. We'll just go straight yeah. to the pubs and and Heineken. And spend there for a few weeks. And, yeah, but Heineck is uh, not a reliable dividend grower. That's what I'm trying to say. But mm. there's a there's a bottom in it always in a crisis. And yeah. and when you buy then, you can get really wealthy from the dividends in the future. Just just know that you will have a dividend cut from time to time. It's really the company here. But I'm with EMF. I didn't know they paid a dividend until today. <laughs> yeah. Well, so um, uh, my interest goes also in uh, Heineken, as you can see. <laughs> Having said that, let's also uh, quickly look at two other companies. So I, I, I picked Relax. So Relax is really um, uh, formerly known as Reed Elsevier. So it's mainly known for um, uh, dividends and such. Uh, sorry, for, for as a data company publisher. And uh, they didn't have really good uh, results this year. Um, you need to know electronic business unit went up a 4%. And that's where they earn their most money. So that's good. But face-to-face uh, -face went down with 73%. Uh, print went down with 14%. So overall, their revenue declined with about, let's say, 10%. Um, but again, they increased the dividend a bit. So I think the company has been um, uh, doing well. 3% dividend increase. Um, they have already paying dividends, growing dividends for, for more than 20 years. So um, it's a company that I'm often looking at because I like this company. Uh, just boring, um, but their power is 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 really, um, you know, you you use Reed Elsevier a lot at work. If you have these expensive scientific databases, for instance, where you pull your information from, often that's Re Reed Elsevier behind it, and those are large lock-ins in organizations and this data, and also with the with data science and such. It's it's a honeypot of information, and and that's why I believe in the future of this company. So, yeah, setback in um, in, in in the year, but uh, it proves again that's a reliable company in uh, in dividend growth. And then uh, awesome. we have also L'Oreal. Would would one of you like to say something about L'Oreal? Yeah, I I had a quick look at L'Oreal, and and really only because we mentioned them a couple of epi episodes ago when we made predictions of four companies. L'Oreal was one of them. And I was quite pleased that we we were right in this case. We we said that we expected a dividend increase of about three to five percent, and they increased it about three point nine percent, which is right in the middle of what we said. So I was quite happy with that. They had a really really strong quarter in growth. Uh, operating profit is up, um, sales is up eighteen percent, earnings per share was up 
and net net cash flow was up as well. So they had a, a really really good good quarter, uh, a nice increase in dividends. So I'm quite happy with with how they performed. Have you checked them out or anything dividend wave? Uh, I have not. So I I know uh, L'Oreal from afar. Uh, strong portfolio, strong brands. Um, I'm I'm really surprised by the results. I I think that the results are. Um, very very strong so especially for the year that we've had they, they do look pretty amazing honestly yeah but yeah uh, st- strong strong brand power and and they seem to be growing so um I, i'm quite impressed with them definitely okay so what we might do now is move on to our listener questions we have a few and the first one is from phil as as always and he, he asked us, assume a market is at an all-time high, what would you do? And he gave us three options. So the first one is stay with your key stocks, even if they are expensive, wait until markets cool down, or look for new companies on page 10 of Google. This is a really simple answer because the, the stock market has been an all-time high probably for 200 days in the last year. And uh, I didn't do a lot with it. So I think it's, uh, for me, option uh, option a at the moment yeah i I didn't even know google had a page 10 (laughs) just stick to the first page (laughs) i mean i mean i i I get the question and at the moment it's it's hard with stocks at all-time high and we mentioned microsoft for example they had a really strong quarter really strong year but the price seems to be expensive as to what i would value them at so what do you do and it's it's a hard it's hard to 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 invest or keep paying money at that price when you expect the, the market to pull back but then on the flip side this market has been overvalued for the last four or five years and it just keeps growing so i don't know i i'm with you it's it's, it's a for me at the at the moment but i can understand anyone who's selecting option b and waiting for the markets to cool down a bit but so what would you do if the market would be now an all-time low buy is that so what if the if the stock market is the next day posting another all-time low buy again <laughs> yeah, but you have cash constraints usually in those situations there's fear in such situations so what i'm trying to say is like uh, the only answer for me is dollar cost averaging hmm. cool how about you dividend wave uh, option a i i think i think the the first part of the question is funny. Imagine that the market is at at all all time high. We're here, right? With uh, have you guys seen the spike in the last minutes of trade today? I just saw it a minute ago. The the, the market spiked in the last minute. So this I don't know how many green days we've had, and th- this is the only part that is making me uh, uncomfortable. And I think we were talking about about this before the show started. You you get to to get a bit. Uh, uncomfortable with it but not page 10 is not an option as well so (laughs) cool so we have a question from peter from belgium and i think this one came in by email and he asked do you take into account double taxation of dividends when selecting a stock and he's given us the example of american stocks in in belgium that are taxed at 15 percent we're holding tax in the us and then again 30 percent in belgium Yeah, I think we had this question a bit more often. So I cannot really speak from a Belgian point of view. Yeah, that, that's hard for me to answer. Um, but for me, I mean, I have the same situation. Uh, in Poland, dividends are taxed at 19% and in the US, 15%. But I can deduct the tax paid uh, on American stocks because of the double taxation treaty. Yeah, so in the end, I need to pay 4% in my co- country here after having paid 15% already in the US. So I assume this would be something similar in Belgium because that's what uh, tip, the typical dividend, uh, double taxation treaty says, Yeah, that you, you shall not much, uh, charge more than 15%. And then usually you can therefore deduct that from your tax. Maybe there's something specific in Belgium, but otherwise I would assume his total tax would be 30% after deducting the 15%. If this is not the case and he really pays 45%, I think dividend investing might then not be indeed attractive unless you go for a very high yield continuously. 
but then you also get a really risky portfolio. I, I think um, if you then really want to retire early, I think you should just move to the Netherlands. That would be my recommendation. And then, then he speaks the language probably already, so this should be an easy one. Yeah, I'm always confused when we get these questions, particularly from, from Belgium, because it, it seems to be that they're taxed to 45%, because we, we've had this a number of times. Um, I don't have that problem in Ireland. Most of the time we have um, a taxation treaty, which is which is 15%. But then in Ireland, depending on your tax bracket and, and other sorts, dividend investing, you can get taxed up to 50, 51% of a dividend. So uh, tax does come into it. Um, certainly for me in that situation and i have an accountant as i said that that helps me with with that but if if it's if you're in the 45 percent bracket yeah maybe maybe dividend investing is not the right way to go okay um we have one from rafa and he has a question about what valuation methods do we trust when we are selecting our stocks so do we just trust our cash flow or do we look at PE ratios, forward ratios, the Schiller ratio, et cetera? This is, um, it, it's a combination of both. In the end, you build a feeling, right? And uh, discount cash flow uh, sometimes even just gives you a false feeling. Uh, there's always some confirmation bias, right? Because for instance, I'm sure that many people are modeling now with Cisco that uh, the, the company will grow 5% going forward. You know, that's what I've seen in all these IBMs over the years. If you go to uh, fast graphs and you look at the estimates, they always shows we're now at the bottom and the next years it will grow again. Yeah. So there's always this false narrative in whatever you do, because when you're evaluating a company today, you're evaluating it for the future prospects. So. Um, and then you have the d dividend discount model. You have the DCF uh, discounted cash flow model. I think this is just all in the mix. For me, the most important is is the business story, the CEO, so the business context. And then uh, when you think about about when is a good uh, moment to buy, well, for me, I have got some some I've got a simple screener. So it needs to be at least let's say two dots to comma 75 percent yield or something like that um so that's what i look at but schiller pa forward ev abita and all these kinds of stuff it's all in the mix yeah if i see too many red flags it's not a good buy um, that's how i look at it but in the end i look most at my discounted cash flow model that's what i look most at too for the price setting because i i trust that model the most how about, how about you? How about you, David and Wave? It's a mix. I, I I would not say that it's a single a single metric, right? And uh, uh, sometimes we suffer from the the bias that EDGI was was just talking about. Then then you you end up the, w with these to justify what what you already want them to justify, right? So I I use a mix as well. For um, I I have one that that I particularly like to look at, which is um, uh, looking at the historical um, dividend yield, I, I really enjoy seeing this. How how is the current yield versus history, right? And especially in uh, in aristocrats, you you've seen uh, you have at least twenty five years of history, right? So you you can know what what the uh, what the the dividend yield was over the over this time, and you see where you are versus history, and you. You can look at periods when you were up or you were down, and try to understand what was the narrative at that time and what was the uh, the, the factor that made it go down. And sometimes you can do this with PE, right? Not so long ago, Apple was trading at uh, a PE of nine, right? And it, everybody was afraid of iPhones were ending. Nobody would buy iPhones anymore, and you could buy Apple for nine, and now it's at thirty-four. So there you go. Th those are the metrics that I. I, some of the metrics that I like to look at, but I think it's the story around it, right? The fundamentals and what is the next leg of the business. Super. Yeah, yeah I agree with you both. Okay, we have a question from uh, Rick Lan, and he asked us, how do you develop a buying strategy? He's having a little bit of trouble deciding how he should position in each stock. 
Yeah, I would I would just um, refer to my allocation strategy on my blog. I can put the link in my um, uh, in, in the description of this uh, podcast. Um, I explain it all there. It's I think a, a too long answer for for this show, but effectively what I say is I don't want to have um, more than four um, percent in, in a position, so that if a, a company <laughs> goes bankrupt, I don't, uh, the the others will carry uh, the weight. Um, and my buying strategy thereby is a dollar cost averaging strategy, really simply said, uh, combination with uh, value investing. And uh, Richland, if you want to know more about it, feel free to send me a DM. I can explain a specific uh, uh, question, uh, answer specific, specific questions that you might have. And David and Wave. Dollar cost averaging, so important. You never know when the bottom is and where the top is, right? And if you like the company, I, I think I remember we were buying Microsoft not so long ago, uh, EMF. I think we, we bought it on the same week at two, 204, 206, something like this. I remember yeah. you tweeted about it. Yeah. There you go. Now it's at 240. So I, I love that the two, uh, 204, 240 getting a bit pricey, but it's a great company. So do your dollar cost average. If it goes down, then you'll you'll still you'll still be in a at uh, building your position you never know where it's going to be in a in a few weeks time yeah uh, i agree and, and look it depends on how big you want your portfolio to be and how you're going to manage it i knew i wanted 32 companies it's it's a nice number for me to manage i wrote down a list of companies that i want I then decided which companies that are quality companies like uh, Microsoft, Johnson and Johnson. I want to have more of them so they go to the top and I'll buy more of them. And then I have companies at the bottom like uh, Royal Dutch Shell or, or WBA and I, I have an allocation for them and that's how that's how I did it. Again, I have I think I have a blog post on that as well, but uh, European DJIs is definitely more comprehensive and I would recommend checking that out. Okay, so EMF, maybe a question for you then. When starting, and this one's from Piotr, uh, one of our, uh, how you said, consistent listeners as well. When starting to build a dividend portfolio, would you go for high yield but low growing stocks to boost investing capital at the beginning, or would you focus on lower yield but high dividend growth? Uh, this one's really easy for me because I, I consider myself a dividend growth investor. And I know you alluded to that earlier on, um, dividend wave, that that there's a key difference in dividend investing and dividend growth investing. So for me, the dividend growth is, is more important. It, it, it doesn't have to be double figures, but I do like to see over five, five percent. Um, really, I want eight percent. but That's me being greedy, but I, I like to see it over over eight percent. So it's nice to have a mix in, in your portfolio, but I don't necessarily go for high yield i do have some some at t for example but I, I my preference is high dividend growth stocks yeah i i would agree with that the, the the usual trap is that you go quicker for the high yield we all want to be rich quick nobody is patient anymore in this world so i i think that's the trap but obviously if if you think uh, a few years down the road probably the the the, the the high growth ends up being a, a long-term uh, principal appreciation. So your capital also appreciates probably faster. Maybe that's not the most important, but uh, it, it's it's going to be uh, uh, probably one of the consequences. Uh, but the good mix is also important. You never know when a high growth company also all of a sudden needs to stop growing as fast. And all of a sudden you're left with a company that was uh, growing fast, but now it's only token token increases that may happen but if uh, i'm a bit different then because if i would start dividend investing now i would probably look more at uh, high yield low growth yeah the, like utilities and such to build the basis of my portfolio knowing that johnson and johnson and such are quite expensive but also knowing that those stocks dip once a year so i don't want to time the market so i will probably now if i would really start today I will probably take few high yielders in my portfolio so that I get the benefit from an early snowball uh, and this feeling. While I would then buy any of the, the higher growth stocks, I would really focus on them as at the moment a dip happens and double down on them. Uh, this probably would be my approach. 
my feeling is money Twitter has gone to your head. <laughs> you, you must be reading too many too many tweets about no AT but i'm not talking about at&t here but you can get anagas now for nine percent why 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 would you wait um with this company if you can get it now while Je johnson johnson is just for me to to up in the air so if i would be really thinking about that and I, have, I have 40 companies i would just take some of the high yielders now in this highly valuated market and wait for um a dip and that's what i've been doing actually uh, usually i make my best buys of johnson johnson and everything on those yearly dips so let's say from the 12 months three four of the month three four times of the month i would be able to get those high quality stocks and the others i'm just dollar cost averaging in some higher yields and and like the known as well that are now under pressure and such uh, yeah, I, I think you're coming to this from a more experienced perspective. But if you're a beginner investor, I mean, stocks that are high yield are high yield for a reason. There, there is risk. You mentioned Energas, for example. There's political risk. There's there's always a risk. That's why they are high yield. And and as a beginner, if you focus too much on these, you, you might be exposing yourself to, to too, too much risk. True, true, true. But, there, there's a balance there always, right? So. Yeah. I, I I believe you have a one pager on this as well, don't you? Where you have a a high yielding stock and a, a growth stock. I I do. It was T versus V. <laughs> T versus. It was a it was AT and T versus Visa. I I do have but, it. But there that's the thing, right? Uh, I do these calculations as well. Sometimes it takes like twenty five years for for that's such right. a company to catch up with a high yielder. So I think it's uh, to your point, dividend wave. It's about the mix, right? But in the beginning, if as long as you know what you do and you're not uh, jumping into yield traps, so uh, um, there's an assumption here that I have a, that I I think someone knows what they are doing, and maybe that's a false assumption. Yeah. Um, otherwise, I, I yeah I would recommend to have to just don't worry too much about it. Have some high yield if it helps you getting the snowball started. Exactly, and and mentally and psychologically, well, psychologically, it's probably important to have that. Well, this is more. This is not just a few cents. I actually got whatever, yeah, a whole exactly. a whole three dollars on this uh, on this quarter. Woo -hoo. That that's an important yeah. feeling. To makes you motivated to go on. Yeah, yeah. You just have to remember to diversify afterwards. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Okay, and we have another question from Dividend and Check, and he asks, "What is your favorite Austrian stock?" Um, his is. And apologies for my my pronunciation. You should all know it's pretty bad at this time, but it's uh, Mayor Melnoff, um, which is apparently a good from a dividend growth point of view. Maybe you want to answer this one, uh, EMF. <laughs> my, my knowledge of Austrian stocks is outstanding, but I, I, the only company I know is Red Bull. You can't buy them on any stock exchange, but if I was to pick an Austrian stock, they're the only company I really know. Yeah, for me the same. I would also take uh, Red Bull. <laughs> How about you, Dividend Wave? I'll, I I I th I told you this. Uh, I would take Do and Co. They are the catering company uh, for Austrian Airlines, and I think for Lufthansa at a certain point in time. I miss traveling, so I'll go with Do and Co. I don't know if they pay a dividend actually, but Do and Co. <laughs> Thank you. So then maybe the last uh, uh, question from our uh, good friend Russ, uh, Depper Dividends. And I'll start with you, EMF. What is an underrated dividend analysis metric? Oh, I don't know. Underrated. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't, nothing, nothing springs to mind. I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll go first. The... I mentioned it previously. It's it's the current yield versus the 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 historical average, whatever you want to take it, four year, five year, twenty years. I like to observe where the company is today versus the the history. So it's not an official metric, but but I like it at least to look at why is the company there now. Yeah, I, I have this with the chowder rule. Not many people know it, uh, maybe. Um, but I find this metric really important because it's kind of a total return metric. It's the it's the yield plus the dividend growth, and you need both to be proper to 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 have a good total return in your portfolio. 
and uh, I don't hear often people talking about it. While on Seeking Alpha, this is a quite well-known uh, metric. So it's maybe not even underrated, probably not widely known enough. So I would definitely vote for the Chowder role. The, um, the, the dividend yield that you look historically, do you have a time period that you go, go back against or do you compare it against the S&P 500, for example? Uh, I look at the company versus itself. Right, yeah. so I, I look, uh, th there's a, a website called uh, Yield Charts, I think it's like this. I'll, I'll send it to you guys or, or I'll, I'll, I'll send it to you to put in the show notes or I'll, tomorrow I'll put it on Twitter. It's, it's a very neat uh, uh, graph that tells you uh, where the company is uh, today versus the, 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 the previous five years or uh, it goes up to 25 years if I recall correctly. It goes, uh, and you can see what yield you're getting today, and historically, what is the the percentage where it's trading today versus the percentage, something like this. You you will see it. I will, I will send it to you. So it's quite interesting that that, that you can go back and analyze what was the what was happening at a certain point in time that the yield went up or down so much. I, I really enjoy that one. To um, because you're comparing the company against itself, which is kind of better than comparing with uh, with peers or with uh, or with the overall market. Okay, cool. That's that's all our questions for this week. So we will move on to our stock pick, and I believe dividend wave. You're going to share one stock that you find interesting in in your own portfolio. Uh, yes, I am. So um, the uh, dividend pick of this week is actually Home Depot. And we uh, we were talking about um, uh, high growth companies, uh, and this is one of them. So actually, Home Depot is a um, uh, one of the largest home improvement retailers uh, in the world. Um, we were talking about the staying at home and uh, th there are some tailwinds from the staying at home, right? People are staying more at home, so they have an incentive as well to improve their houses. They work more on their gardens. So uh, th there's clearly a, a tailwind there for the industry. They're, um, they're making an acquisition uh, or, or they, they just concluded an acquisition, which is for HD Supply, which is an industrial uh, MRO company, so uh, a repair and maintenance company. Um, and uh, the interesting part here is that they've been growing dividends for 11 years now. They trade at um, a PE of 24, so another metric uh, that, that we've discussed before, 35% free cash flow payout, um, a starting yield that a current yield is uh, 2.17. So this uh, this goes back to uh, EDGI a little bit outside of the EDGI's range of 275, but um, the, uh, the there is the uh, the earnings call which is on the 23rd the 23rd of February, and they're expected to announce a dividend increase. So it will go closer to your uh, to your level, and uh, the the interesting part here is that they're. Uh, compound uh, annual growth rate is has been over 20% for the last seven years. So really, uh, really big jumps in the uh, in the in the dividend. The the last uh, uh, dividend increase was 10%. So plus two of the dividend yield, you're at 12. So the the chowder of it, it's it's around 12. So not too bad. It's an amazing company, Home Depot. I uh, can't say anything else about it. Just an amazing yeah. company. And I just got uh, another two tidbits of information. One is that over the last 10 years, um, actually Home Depot has outperformed the NASDAQ. So it's interesting to see a non-tech company uh, beating beating tech. So that, that's always an interesting one. And we were discussing. I have no clue where the where the price is going to go. But last year, the performance was exactly on track to the Nasdaq until November. As of November, it's been flat. So if you if you look at the price action, it's been stuck in the in that range around 260 to 70, um, and it lost it lost traction to the uh, to the Nasdaq. So the Nasdaq outperformed since since November. But it's. Um, it's it's really a company I I uh, I like. I'm not invested in it. Um, 
I, I was already about to initiate a, a few times for one reason or another. I, I dumped my money in AT&T or, <laughs> or somewhere else. So, but I, I really like the company. So I, I don't know about you guys. EDGI, you said you liked it, right? So it's a good yeah, company. I think it's a brilliant company. I've been following it for years. It always feels a, a little bit too expensive for me. Um, but it's a brilliant company. Well executed. Uh, there's no reason to not have it in your portfolio, but I don't have it in my portfolio. It's simple like that. <laughs> you know? I, I've been just checking them out on, on the website you gave us, yieldchart.com. It's a pretty cool website, actually. Um, and if you're to look at their average dividend yield, it's 1.67%. So you could you could say that they are there's value in their price price at the moment. The the only time I can see that they got where EDG I would like to invest them in is is around the last financial financial crash between 2008, 2009, 2010. So you might see them get to those levels again if we see another another crash but look they're they're a great company everybody knows what you're getting with them and, and that that dividend growth rate is is phenomenal and to be and hey and to be tech companies in this environment you can't get much better than that yeah respect <laughs> yeah. so thank you i think we came to the end of the show with this uh, thank you also for your stock pick dividend wave uh, i really enjoyed it that you joined us and um, it's actually impressive that we didn't talk about disney today of course but hey this is dividend talk this is not uh, whatever uh, growth talk this is dividend <laughs> talk so but thanks for joining us dividend wave uh, honestly i hope to see you one more time again on the show and uh, yeah thank you very much thank you guys it's been it's been brilliant invite me back when intel reports that's that's the most fun we can have. Super. So thank you as well, EMF. Um, and I could just uh, wish everyone a great weekend. So see you next time again. And uh, thanks. Thanks, everyone.